Hello, Mission Church. My name is Tyler. I am the worship pastor here um, at Mission Church. And uh, I just want to welcome you today to our online service. Um, so basically, we have finished the first section, the first half of the letter to the Ephesians. We finished this last week uh, when Pastor Kyle, uh, he was talking about Paul's prayer for the church. And now we're moving into the second half of the book of Ephesians. And in the first half, what Paul was talking about was our identity in Christ. He talked about the mystery, which is this beautiful, diverse, and this beautiful church that we can be united in. And now we continue in chapter four in a section called Walking in Unity. And this is about a unified church moving forward together towards one goal. So let's talk about unity. Unity takes work. It, it takes preparation. It takes trust. It takes a number of people doing their part to accomplish one goal. And, and if you, like me, have ever been involved in any type of sport, we know what it involves. It involves unity. And it was kind of funny, this past week I was talking with my wife about just going over my message like I like to do. And uh, I was talking about this section with her, and she was like, you know, I kind of relate with this. Um, in high school, she was a pole vaulter um, at a local high school down the street. And basically, she did not know in track that what she did in pole vaulting contributed to the overall success of the track team. She thought just because she was a pole vaulter. It was just about her. It was just about her PR, her, the, the height that she can go to as a pole vaulter. And she didn't know that her point system was contributing to the overall point system to help her team of Algafria High School track team to win the track meet. And she had no idea for the longest time, and it was a shock to her. And, and this applies in the same way to the church. The problem is that many of us don't think about our responsibility in the church, and more importantly, our responsibility as the church. Maybe because we aren't aware of God's goal and purpose for his church, and maybe even where we fit into it. Maybe we're unsure of that. And so what is our goal? Well, our goal is to build a strong, unified church that points its community to Jesus Christ. And so I want to look on the flip side of that as well. I want to talk about what destroys a unified church. What tears a unified church down? Uh, Pastor Woody a few weeks ago actually talked about this, but division. This is a huge one. Division theologically, legalistically, traditionally, po politically, morally. Sometimes we can't even agree on certain things in the church. And as I was thinking about this this week, do you think it's attractive for a non-believer, for an outside person to look inside the windows at Christianity and want to be a part of this thing that we can't even be unified in? That we can't even agree on most topics. We can't even be together as one body at most times, what it seems like. Other things that destroy unified church are spiritual immaturity, hypocrisy, unforgiveness, bitterness, and pride. These are things that tear down a unified church. And so what we are going to be doing today is to see in Ephesians 4 what it takes to build a strong, thriving, and unified church that leads people to Jesus. And we get to see where we fit in to this movement. And so I want to take us to scripture right now. We are now moving into chapter 4, verse 1, and this is Paul's ache for the church, a very clear ache that Paul is describing here. And we're just going to read verse 1 in chapter 4. Paul says, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. This verse 1 here is very significant 
because this is the pivotal point for the rest of the letter. This is the topic sentence for the rest of the letter to the Ephesians. When Paul says, therefore, he is transitioning to the second half of the letter. In chapter 3, he ends with this prayer, and then he says, therefore, in other words, for that reason, I beg you, I urge you to lead a life worthy of, of your calling. So what do we see here? We see the first section of Ephesians is the calling. And the second half is walking worthy of the calling. And he says this other word in there as well in verse 1. He says the word worthy. I want you to live a life worthy of your calling. And at first, I don't know if, if it does with you, but for me, it's kind of an intimidating word. It kind of describes, in my own mind, maybe something that I have to measure up to. But Paul isn't talking about measuring up to anything here. What Paul is talking about is fitting in. He wants us to walk in equilibrium. He wants us to walk with balance with each other. Walking worthy is, is, is not about you being good enough because the fact is, is that we will never be good enough. This is why Jesus had to come and save us. We don't measure up to his good and perfect standards. Being worthy is about stepping into a reality that has been created for us and walking in it. And so what is this reality? Well, this reality is a unified church. And now we move on to Ephesians 4, verse 2. And Paul says, and he's talking about here walking worthy of the calling, and he tells us how to do so. He says, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. And here, Paul then talks about the behavior appropriate to the calling and how unity can also be recognized in the church. Paul talks about humility and, and gentleness, right? I think of the word meek, to be meek like Jesus. And then he talks about patience, and then he talks about forbearance and love. And what this means is to not hold anything against your brother and sister, but instead bear one another's burdens, reconcile, because there is no space in the body of Christ to hold anything against your brother and sister. This is what Paul is talking about. And, and last week when Pastor Kyle was talking about Paul's prayer for the church in chapter 3 and in verse 17, Paul prayed that the church would be rooted and established in love. And now what he's doing, he's taking what he said, what he prayed for, and he is addressing it and urgently calling the church to act accordingly in this way. And now we move on to the next few verses. Verse 3 through 6, Paul says, Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace, for there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. What this shows here is as believers, we have been called into one body and have been given a role in the body. Being a part of the body of Christ, of course, has its privileges to it. It has its perks. But what also comes with it is a responsibility. Paul tells us to make every effort to keep ourselves united in the Spirit, to maintain the unity of the Spirit. And this is very important to recognize. We do not create the unity. The Spirit of God does. We maintain the unity as the body of Christ. Our job is to be zealous to maintain it. And now here's the fact. In church, we have differences. Different preferences on, on worship music, ways of doing ministry, differences of style of preaching, differences in the way we do communion and baptism. And you're lying if you say you don't have preferences in these things. 
But here's the good news. That's expected. That's okay. Jesus knew what he was doing in building a diverse church with different opinions, different preferences, different points of view. That is the beautiful thing about this diverse church that Jesus has created. But many times what happens is the church can minor on the majors and major on the minors. And this is where division is created. And let me explain this. We allow the minor things like worship, like traditions, like how we do children's ministry, how we maybe make coffee, I don't know, whatever it may be, but we allow these things to dictate our unity. But let the minor things be minor because they are just preferences. The major is this, that Jesus is Lord and he is the way, the truth, and the life and no one comes to the Father but through him. And this is all that matters. When we let the minors be minor and the major thing be the major, what happens is we maintain our unity because Jesus is the center and he is the one true thing that matters. I've been at a few different churches, and I've been at Mission Church since the very beginning, actually. And so I've I've seen the ins and the outs of how the ministry works, and and, um, we've seen people leave Mission, and we've seen people come to Mission for different reasons, come from other churches, or people go from Mission to other churches. And that's okay. Find a church that fits for you. But here's the thing, don't bad talk a church you're coming from. Don't bad talk a church if you're coming to a new church, if if you've come to mission, I've heard too many times other churches be bad talked and that's why you end up through our doors that does nothing but create division in the church. There are so many churches around us within just a 10 mile radius and we don't compete with them, We, we root for them. They might have a different way of doing church, but they are reaching people that we may never be able to reach, and we are doing the exact same. And Paul says here, make every effort to keep this peace. This is vital for the future of the church. And so we see what Paul, his ache, we see what he's wanting the church to to do in this next part we are going to see how we maintain a unified church and so we're going to jump down a bit to verse 11 and paul is still talking to the church and he says this he says now these are the gifts christ gave to the church the apostles the prophets the evangelists and the pastors and teachers And their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work, to build up the church, the body of Christ. And so let's ask ourselves, how do we maintain a unified church? Well, the first way, Paul says it very clearly here in this text, biblical leaders equipping saints for the work of ministry. Why did Jesus give these gifts? He gave it for discipleship. He gave them to multiply, to grow the church. This is the church's model of discipleship. How did Jesus and 12 apostles change the world forever? It was this exact model. God gave his son, and Jesus equipped 12 apostles, and here we are today. The church is here today, still standing strong, still thriving, still moving forward as one body. Biblical leaders leaders equipping saints for the work of ministry. This text shows that the leaders of the church are not meant to do all the ministry. They are meant to equip others to do ministry, to spread the gospel, and to build the church. Paul, in another letter, in in 2 Timothy, he says this. He says, but you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. 
You have been taught the holy scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Jesus Christ. And then he says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to what? Teach us what is true. And to make us realize what is wrong in our life, it corrects us when we are wrong and teach us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every work. And so we see this. We see that it takes biblical leaders using scripture to equip the people of the church to do the work of ministry. But what is the second part of this? And this is the second point that I want to make. It takes biblical leaders, but it also takes equipped saints doing ministry. And I'm going to flip everything upside down for some people right now. Let me just say, the church is not about you. You are not just to come in, enjoy a message and music like it's some movie or a theater play and leave. We are not, to, we are not meant to be consumers, but doers. I want you to ask yourself this right now. Do I only soak up what the church offers, or do I pour back out into the church? giving my time, service, gifts, and finances. Our goal is to get you back into the game and not to keep you on the sidelines. And Paul makes it very clear in this text that you have a starting role on this team called the body of Christ. It is your responsibility to keep healthy and active as long as you are submitting yourself to biblical leaders in the church. You are called to be an equipped saint doing ministry in the church. And so how else do we maintain a unified church? The third and and final point that I want to make is a maturing church. He goes on in verses 13 through 14. And Paul says this, This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. And I love this. He says, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like truth. A maturing church is not defined by the size of the church. A maturing church is defined by the people in it. My two and a half year old daughter, she has this hilarious, cute thing to where she says, obviously the magic word, please, but she takes it a little bit far. Uh, Sometimes she'll ask for a yogurt or something after she wakes up and we'll be like, Ellie, you ate all the yogurt right before your nap, but she'll say, but please, Dada, but please, Mama. And she'll keep saying please, like the yogurt is going to magically appear in the fridge. And it's cute, and it's funny, but it wouldn't be when she's 16 years old. She's going to mature one day, and she's going to realize the reality and truth of things. She will realize that that's not how the magic word actually works. She can't pick and choose her reality, because reality is reality. And in the same way, when we mature in our faith, we set our foundation in truth. We leave the childish things behind us. When we mature in our faith, we realize that as a saint, as a child of God, and as a part of the body of Christ, we can no longer pick and choose our reality because God has given us a reality as a believer, and that is to live a life worthy of your calling, maintain unity, and to build his church. Going back to verses one through six, this is our reality. And we need more maturity in the church. When culture pushes back on our faith, when Christians are picking and choosing what they want to believe out of scripture, when the Bible is being mixed up with all of these spiritual fads, 
In other words, what Paul is saying here, when the wind is blowing, as the scripture says, we need to be a tree. As Kyle talked about last week, a tree with deep, set-in roots to where we are unmoved. And we won't be tossed and blown away and influenced when culture pushes other doctrines and ideology and ideas on us. And this takes spiritual maturity. And maybe you're already serving and you want to take your next step in maturing your faith. We would love to help you in that. We want to make more mature believers here. Again, the church is not defined, the maturity of a church is not defined by the size of it. It's defined by the people in it. Are we growing? Do we have this desire to grow and be all that God has called us to be in the body of Christ? We have Tuesday night courses that are college-level courses taught by some of our pastors here. This is an amazing way to mature your faith even more. Leading a small group, being mentored, leading a ministry, these are ways, very tangible ways, that we can mature spiritually in our faith. And so let me recap these three for us right now. How do we maintain a unified church? Well, one, biblical leaders equipping saints for the work of ministry. Two, equipped saints doing ministry. And three, a maturing church. And so now what happens when we build, when we maintain this unified church? What is the fruit? Well, Paul ends this section of Ephesians 4 in verse 15 through 16. He says, instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way. And I want to make known, when he says instead, he's saying instead of being immature, this is who we are. This is how we act. I'll read that again. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way, more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. He's bringing it all together here at the very end. This is maturity. This is a unified church. And I can't help when I read this but be reminded of one of the most beautiful examples of unity that I have ever seen in my entire life. The past couple years, if you've been along with us, if you've been with us, you might be new and maybe have no idea what these last couple years have had in store for Mission Church. But a couple years ago, there was this other church called West Point. And we were brought together, Pastor Kyle, and he met this guy named Pastor Richard, with a, which many of you know and love today. And we had no idea how this was going to go. We've heard horror stories of churches merging. The unity just not clicking. It doesn't work. But what happened was these two leaders, Pastor Kyle and Pastor Richard, came together. And they said, you know what, we're different. We have different worship styles. We have different philosophies in some way. Some of my people think differently about this topic and some of ours think different, differently about that topic. But they let the minors be the minor. And the one major that they united under, the one faith is that Jesus is Lord and he wants to do something new and good in this city that we are both trying to serve and we are going to be stronger together. We can put aside our differences and we can be mature and unite in one faith, in one body, and in one spirit that creates the unity and we can maintain this unity and reach the city of Goodyear for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we have set aside these differences and solely united under that one faith, I will tell you, we have been thriving. 
we have been growing and maturing as a church. And I tell this story because I want to ask you a question now. How are you contributing to the unity of the church? What part are you playing? Are you serving? Are you giving? Or or using the gifts God has given you to serve others and build the church? Because let me paint this picture for you. Just imagine what the church would look like and what kind of impact we would have here in Goodyear if we were all playing our part as every limb of the body coming together, walking forward in unity, reaching the community for Jesus. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your unity that you create for us, for your church. And Lord, we are thankful. We pray that we just continue to walk in it, trusting you, trusting in the God above all of this and why we do all of these things, Lord. Lord, we're just thankful that we just get to be a part of this, that we get to do what we do, and we get to serve people, and we get to build your church because this is the greatest responsibility, Lord, that you have given us. And so we thank you for all things. And that we pray that you continue to lead your church, Jesus. And we pray this in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, thank you for being with us this Sunday. Um, we love you. And please be back with us next week as we continue in our next Uh, part of this series going through the book of Ephesians. So church, remember you are loved.